So here we are in the shop today and I'm getting ready to steam bend ribs for a full size canoe. Now the technique that I use for this is very similar to how I steam bend ribs for my smaller pack canoes, but there's some additional considerations. So I wanted to make a separate video for this. Also just to show you some of the updates to the system as well to make sure you're as current as possible on the latest advances in our bending technique. So this particular canoe here is 16 feet long by 36 inches wide. It's about 14 inches deep. So just kind of your standard straight ahead, double paddler, uh, wilderness tripping prospector style canoe. And I'm gonna go ahead and bend all the ribs in here. You can see I've got all my rib lengths pre-cut using my rib measuring system. I've got all of my rib mortises marked for the number of the rib it is so I don't get confused. And then one additional thing that I do here is I like to write the actual physical length of rib number one and two on the gunnels because ribs number one and two are usually not right on your first go around. So when it comes time to replace these two ribs, it's good if you know where you were starting so you know how much to add to the next ones. Now, as far as the keel goes here, this is the same thing as before, except the keel for a full-size canoe is gonna be a little bit wider. So I've got a little bit wider keel that's just screwed down temporarily to the top of the stem. The stem hasn't been shaped yet because oftentimes we change the height of this a little bit before we decide on the final shaping. And that's a great way to change the maneuverability characteristics of your canoe because you can add a progressive rocker just right towards the ends if you want to. So coming to the center here, you can see the keel is supported on a wider block than we were using before. And the reason I'm doing this now is because by using a wider block like this, not only is it easier to square the block up to the uh, plane of the canoe here, but also you can put a couple clamps on either side of it and that allows you to move the keel up and down without it continually falling off the block. So that's the basic setup for the canoe here. You can see that I've got the sawhorses supported underneath it at the 25% interval in the front and the 25% interval in the back, which just helps support it nicely while you're doing your bend. Not super critical at this point, but when it does come time to tie your stringers on, it's really important to make sure that your boat is supported evenly so the weight of the stringers and the clamps doesn't change your rocker or change your shear. Okay, so that's the canoe. Now let's head back to the steam box. So my steam box here is something I've been doing for probably 20 years now. It's just a really simple plywood box, a couple sheets of half inch plywood separated by some one by twos. It's got a couple dowels on the inside that go across that just hold the ribs up into the steam. And then feeding this steam box, I've got just a really simple wallpaper steamer that you could fill with water and plug into the wall. I feed the hose into the steam box and it's just a nice, simple, safe way to generate a lot of steam. Now, it's really important that this steam box is super hot before you start ribbing your canoe. You want to be able to actually get a steam burn if you put your hand right here. I don't know how you test that without actually putting your hand right there. But the point is this needs to be really, really hot. Otherwise, you're not gonna get good bending. So I usually let this run for 20 minutes before I even think about putting a rib in it. And then another thing to be cognizant of during your bend is to make sure you're not running out of steam. And I usually have a kettle off to the side, an electric kettle that I can boil halfway through and then put more water in here so I don't run the risk of this running dry. So go ahead and put the towel back over to block the steam there. Now, in addition to your steam box, you're also gonna need some gloves so you can hold on to the hot ribs as they come out of the steam box. And I usually just have a chunk of an old belt. And all I need to use this for is just to back the bends on the first couple ribs where they have a really steep bend so they don't split out. Okay, so next thing, let's head over to what I like to call the rib hospital. And this is the area where I've got all my tools set up. Everything's nice and clean and organized in case I need to replace any ribs that break during the process. So. What I've got here is some really good rib stock. This isn't crappy stuff. This is actually some of the best stuff because if you break a rib, usually you're in a little bit of a stressful situation. So you don't wanna reach for some crappy stuff. You wanna get a really nice, good piece, replace your rib and get it back into rotation. I've got a tape measure to measure my ribs. I've got a block plane to round them over. I've got a saw to cut them to length. And then I've got my rib measuring stick here that helps me determine the length. Now you can do this one of two ways. You can stretch the rib that you broke out and just use that same length, or you can re-measure it off the canoe using the same system that you used originally. 
Now, right here, I've just got a nice long straight edge that I use to measure. It's just a really quick, easy way to measure the lengths of this. And there's some more information on that in other videos, so I'm not gonna go over that here. Finally, I've got a two by four with a slot cut down the middle. And this is just what I use for rounding my ribs over. So I drop the rib into the slot like this. I take my block plane, I run it down all four sides of this, and that rounds the edges over. And then really conveniently here, all I've got to do is just take my block plane like this, and I can round the ends of the ribs as well, and that just helps them slide into the mortises. Now, if you're working on a large canoe, like a full-size canoe, you're also gonna to need to thin the ends of these out, otherwise they're not gonna fit in the mortises. And how I'm doing that these days is I'm just taking it out to my table saw, I'm raising the blade all the way up, and then I'm just sliding these in a little bit and pulling them back out. And that leaves kind of a rounded edge, but in reality, you don't notice that in your canoe, and it's a lot safer than trimming these vertically on the table saw. All right, so that's everything you're gonna need. Let's go ahead and get started bending. Okay, so I've been steaming for a little while here. I'm sure your first question is, how long do you steam for? And unfortunately, that's not a question I can actually answer because it really depends on the quality of your stock, how hot your steam box is, and also how fast you feel comfortable working. So for instance, I like to put these in and take them out at one minute intervals because I feel comfortable working that fast. And this particular stock seems to bend pretty well at about seven minutes, but every single piece of wood is gonna be different. So before you start firing up with your really good bending stock, I would recommend doing some tests the day before to figure out at what interval and at what steaming time these bend the best for you. I will say, however, that the most common mistake that people make is over steaming their wood and then assuming they'd under steamed it and then steaming it for even longer and longer and it just makes the problem worse and worse. So if you think that you're starting to get breaks, consider steaming for less time before you start steaming for more time. So this is rib number one here. Rib number one gets a really steep bend. And one of the things I do just so I can get the steepest possible bend here, is I make this rib a little bit thinner. So this rib is a little bit thinner than the other ribs for the canoe. And I do that to rib number one and rib number two. So this is about the steepest bend that I can get. I'm gonna put this in the canoe. And it would not surprise me at all if this rib is a little bit too short, because usually the first couple are. However, I have lately been adding a little bit of extra length, just kind of randomly to my first few ribs to see if I could figure out a way to systemize that. So in this case, I think I added an extra like seven eighths or something, and it looks like it came out pretty well. So that's great. I may not have to replace this rib. It's important that this rib gets a really steep bend to it, and that also that bend is right in the middle of the canoe because you definitely don't want your stem tilting one direction or the other, and it's really important to have a very fine entry. A canoe has a fairly full-bodied water line, but the entry needs to be fine enough so it doesn't start to plow water while you're paddling through the water. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. So I'm gonna go on to the next one. Every time I bend a rib, I put another rib in. And the only exception to that would be if I was starting to break ribs because I was steaming them for too long. In that case, I might subtract a rib from the process just to shorten the overall time. So I've got rib number two here. I'm gonna back this with a belt as well. And another nice steep bend on rib number two. These guys are a little bit over steamed, but the bending stock that I have is really good. So it looks like I'm getting away with it. Okay. Rib number two in this case, I also cut a little bit longer than I needed to. And that's actually a decision I'm regretting at the moment. So I might actually take a saw this is something I wouldn't necessarily recommend. I would say that if you had a problem with a rib length, and this is truthfully why you should start with the rib lengths that are shown in the plans and not do what I did and try to guess the process, because sometimes you're right, but most of the time you're wrong. It's easier just to burn a few ribs at either end and then fix it than to try to game the system. So 
Anyways, I'm going to take a little bit off the end here. Take about a half inch overall off the rib. And that should get me back to my actual original measurement here. And you can see that these ribs stay pliable for a long time. So if you can work quickly, there's actually quite a lot of room to manipulate things here. So who knows if that's actually the right length, but we're going to go with that for right now. I'm going to move on to rib number three. Once again, I always put a rib in when I take a rib out. So moving on to rib number three here. Rib number three is also kind of a V. This is a pretty simple bend. You're just doing something about like this. All right, I feel pretty good about that. Okay, take a look at this. I always look at my symmetry straight down the canoe like this. Your eye has a magnificent sense of symmetry if you just relax and don't try to force it. So if you just let your mind go kind of blank and look at something and kind of blur your eyes, you get a really easy sense of the overall symmetry and you can just kind of push things that around a little bit to get things nice and straight. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's really important when you're bending any kind of a boat that your boat is square to the room. Never, ever, ever bend on a diagonal because the lines at the edges of the room will pull your eye and you won't be able to see the symmetry very well. All right, so go to rib number four. I'm talking a lot, so these ribs are actually overcooking, but this is the nice thing about working with really good rib stock is that it's really forgiving. So rib number four here, I'm bending this into kind of a U shape and then I'm bending it further like this. And I'm doing this because we don't want this to have too much outward pressure here or it'll mess up the shape of the canoe. So this is the shape we're looking for, but we're gonna actually bend it like that so it holds that shape. I'm gonna put it in here. Now something that's very important using my system is that you don't let this rib push up on the keel. This keel is already hanging in the natural position right here that it's supposed to be. And if you let these ribs push the keel up, it's gonna totally mess up the shape of the boat and it's also gonna mess up your rocker and you know, so. When I do this, I get the shape I want and then I push it down. You see how I'm doing this? And then I just let it come back up and I let it slowly drift up until it barely touches right here. And that's what we want. And this is something you want to kind of monitor during your entire bending process. So in addition to just looking and checking your symmetry here, you also have to make sure you're not pressing up on the keel. Now, as we get back towards kind of the, not the middle of the canoe, but the middle between the front of the canoe and the middle of the canoe, I start bending these in a shape that's more like this. I just bend them into a semicircle, and once again, that's so you're relieving the stress in the ribs. So when it's finally in the canoe, it's not pressing the canoe open. Now, in double canoe like this, it's not a big deal because you're going to be putting seats and thwarts in there, and that will substantially help it hold its shape. But in a smaller pack canoe where you don't have those things, you want to make sure that the canoe is holding its own balanced tension. So once again, I'm bending it kind of like this and then letting it spring back. Now, something that's really important here is that you're switching which end came out of the steam box when you put it in the canoe. And the reason you're doing that is because if you put all the same ends in one side of the canoe, there's gonna be a little bit of different tension in the ribs depending on whether it was toward the back or the front of the steam box. And that's gonna transfer into the canoe and you're gonna end up with an asymmetrical boat. So the way I like to keep track of this is I just look at the number that I had written on the end of the rib to keep track of which rib it was. And I'll have the numbers going one way and then I'll have the numbers going the other way and the other way. And this just keeps the tensions balanced. Okay, so. And once again, you can really see how you have a lot of time to manage this if you're working with really good bending stock. Just 
kind of. And that is the reason to spend the money if you need to, to buy good bending stock, because there's nothing more miserable than trying to accomplish a skin on frame build with kind of half ass bending wood. It just ends up being really frustrating. And by the end of it, you just wish you would have spent the money to buy the good stuff in the first place. Once again, I'm just going to bend this into kind of a semicircle here, like this. Helps to kind of relieve the pressure. And then I'll put it in the canoe. Make sure that I'm alternating my ends side to side so I don't mess up the tension of the boat. And when you're looking at your symmetry, you really don't want to get lost in the details. I mean, you want to have an overall sense of symmetry, but if you're really trying to even out every little flat spot, you're going to burn way too much time. So I would recommend when you look at a boat from the end like this, you just kind of blur your eyes and relax and just get an overall impression of the shape that you're creating. Once again, it's important to push your ribs down like this and let them just barely drift up to the keel. If this is starting to progressively push the keel up, you're making a mistake. Okay, that looks good. Okay, this is the last one here that I'm gonna do in kind of a semicircle like this, and then I'm gonna switch towards just bending the ends. So you can see what I got going on here. I'm gonna stick this in the canoe. One good way to even out the symmetry of your bend is just to press this down further than it needs to go like this, because that'll press the same amount of tension into either curve here, and then you can let it relax up, and that can really help to even out an uneven curve. I can't see it from here, so I always have to come to the end and take a look, and that looks pretty good. I like that. Looks like it's pushing up on the keel a little bit, so I'll be cognizant of that. Okay, so on the next rib here is where things start to maybe get a little bit trickier. Taking out my rib, and I'm going to leave a little bit of the rib, like a couple inches sticking out of each palm, like this, and I'm going to bend like that. And you can see I'm really over bending this. And what this is doing is this is putting the rib bend in the location that we want it. Now in the smaller canoes what we do is we have you do the same thing but the rib is flush with the end of your palm. So it's just concentrating this bend a little bit higher up on the rib. And that looks pretty good. I've bent it in a lot. See what I'm doing there? That's important because you don't want to force the canoe open. And then I'm going to put it in the canoe. And you can see the effect that that has. That actually puts a pretty substantial flat spot right here before it starts to bend. I actually went a little bit too far with that, so I'm going to undo that a little bit. But overall, that's what I'm looking to accomplish. So your first three ribs here are going to be very V-shaped. And then you're going to kind of head into a semicircular shape till you get towards, you know, getting closer to the middle. And then you're going to kind of square it off a little bit, although not totally square because that shallow arch shape in the bottom of the canoe is really important for the tracking performance that you're looking for. A super flat bottom canoe is nice and stable, but it doesn't necessarily paddle all that well. Okay, once again, I'm leaving a little bit of the rib sticking out of my palm. Not too much. Two inches tops. I'm bending the ends in. I'm really over bending these ends so I can take the tension out of the rib. Because if your rib's too stiff, then you don't have the opportunity to put some tumble home into it. If you really relieve this tension at the ends, then your gunnels will push in a little bit. And if you want to add just a tiny bit of tumble home, you can do that. This system is not really the best way to build a skin on frame canoe if you're looking for a dramatic tumble home, but we can tease a little bit in the middle. All right, 
So far, so good. Come to the end, check your symmetry. It's looking pretty good. Every time I take a rib out, I put a rib in. Okay, once again, rib is sticking just a little bit out of my palm on either side. Make sure it's sticking out even, so you put the bend in the right place. Bending inward like this. These guys are feeling a little bit stiff, so I might actually start extending my interval a little bit, see if I can get them a little bit floppier. And that really could go either way. They could be stiff because they've been in there for too long, or they could be stiff because they haven't been in there for long enough. You just kind of have to experiment. Now, I'm looking at this shape that I just created here, and I'm seeing a really strong flat spot right here. I don't like that, so I'm gonna get in here, and I'm gonna push this a little bit, just to get it to bend inward a little bit right there. If you get too much of a straight spot on your sides, you're gonna have a very boxy canoe, and what you're looking for is a canoe that is a little bit slack right here, and then kind of rounds into a shallow arch shape. You don't want this to go straight up and then straight over, unless that's what you're looking for in a canoe. Hmm. Okay, that looks a little bit better to my eye. So on this particular bend, I'm going back to the way that I do this in pack canoes, which is just putting this at the end of my palm right here and then bending it over my thumb because I've been feeling as I've been bending this here like I'm getting a little bit too much of a straight spot right here so I'm going to try this instead and see how that goes. Once again making sure that I flip them end for end. See how that looks. I've got a much slacker bend right here. And you can see that as I do this, I just kind of go through here and just kind of push things around a little bit. The most important thing about steam bending any boat, especially if you're free bending like I am here, is just to stay calm. If you start getting really stressed out, usually that starts to create more and more problems and then you get more stressed out. And if you could just relax during the process and not stress out about it, usually goes a lot better. Now, if you're ever wondering whether your ribs are getting stiff because they've been steaming for too long or whether they're stiff because they're not steaming for long enough, a really easy way to answer that question is to go a couple ribs back in your sequence, like two or even three ribs back, and try that one because that one will have been in there for less time. And if that bends nice and easy, well, there you go. You know that you're steaming for too long. But if it's even stiffer, then you know you need to steam for a little bit longer. So that brings us to the middle of the canoe here. I'm gonna go ahead and rib the back half of this canoe, not on camera, so this video isn't too long. But just to kind of recap what we just did here, for the first three ribs, we bent those into a very steep V shape. I wouldn't expect the first two ribs to come out perfectly. You'll probably have to replace those later, maybe not. Um, 
For the next ribs, from rib number four to somewhere about 25% of the way down the canoe, you're going to want to bend these into basically a circle shape in your hands, and then you're going to want to let them relax into a U shape, put them into the rib mortises, and then push them down so they're not pushing up on the keel. And then when you get towards the center of the canoe, it's right about here, that's when you're going to want to start bending more towards the ends and less towards the middle. And you're going to take the rib in your palm and you're going to put the rib flush with the end of your palm. You're going to fold your thumb over it like that. And then you're going to bend it really steeply inward. And I usually do this, you know, in a series of bends. I don't just crank it in like that. I like to kind of ease that in and then I can put it in the canoe and then check my symmetry. Uh, final thing to remember, make sure you are constantly switching your ends one side to the other, one side to the other. Otherwise, it's going to put a funny tension in one side of the canoe and you're going to have issues with symmetry down the line. So I'm going to go ahead and finish ribbing this guy and then I'll probably close this up with a few final comments. So one more thing I want to mention when you're halfway through your bend, it's really important to check the water level in your steam box. And if your water level is running low, what you want to do is put on a kettle of water to boil. That way, when you get about two thirds of the way through the canoe, this will be boiling and you can go ahead and pour this into the steam box to refresh the steam. It's really important that you only add boiling water to the steam box. If you add regular temperature water or even hot tap water, it's going to cool it down and it's going to interrupt your steam cycle. So just make sure you keep an eye on your water level. That way you don't accidentally boil dry. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of my bend here. I only broke one rib, so I'm going to start by replacing that. You can see this rib here has a little cracked spot in it where it had some bad grain. So I'm going to go ahead and just flatten this rib back out here, lay it down. I'm going to put some good fresh rib stock on top of it. And I'll go ahead and cut this to length. And then I'll just go ahead and round all four sides, round off the end so it slides down into the mortise, and then use my table saw to thin this out. I'll put it back in the steam box, and then after about five or six minutes, I'll put it back in the canoe. When I got to the ends here, I was pretty happy with how rib number one bent. I did a little experiment. I did ribs number one and two a little bit longer than the instructions, and I did ribs number 30 and 31 exactly at the instructions. And it turns out that in the front, making rib number one a little bit longer ended up being perfect, but rib number two needed to be the same length. And in the back, rib number two was the same length, so that was perfect, but rib number one needs to add a little bit, which is why I recommend just following the instructions. And then if something seems a little bit off, you can either shim it or you can replace the rib. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace these last ribs, and then that's it for this particular canoe. I feel like this bend went pretty well here. I wasn't certain when I designed this system if I was gonna scale this up into full-size canoes, and I have to say that as I've been trying to apply it to like little rowboats and stuff like that, it really doesn't work very well. It just gets kind of hard to manage that long of a wood in a free bending context. But so far, everything that I've done up to the size of this 36 inch wide, 16 foot long tripping canoe has actually worked out really well. And that is awesome because this is a huge time savings over any other technique. And it seems like it's something that as long as you're working with good bending wood, even an average person could be able to get this same type of result. So. That is steam bending, a full-size canoe.